I'll begin. I'm Andrea Tone. I'm a professor of history in the departments of social studies of medicine and history and classical studies at McGill. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, who is Olivia Weiser, an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. <coughs> After graduating from Wesleyan University in 2002, Professor Weiser pursued graduate work in the history of medicine at John Hopkins University, where her research was funded by multiple competitive grants from, to name just a few, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Historical Association, the Fulger Shakespeare Library, and a Mellon pre-dissertation fellowship in the humanities for study at the Institute of Historical Research. After earning her PhD in the history of medicine at Johns Hopkins in 2010, she worked as a postdoctoral lecturer at Princeton University for two years, where she taught on the history of the body, science and gender, and the anatomy of gender before being recruited to the history department at UMass Boston. Um, I had the opportunity to review her vita before today, and I will say that although her very robust research and teaching record do not appear to have afforded her much protected downtime or writing time, Professor Weiser has published just five years after she earned her PhD, her very first monograph uh, published by Yale University Press entitled Ill-Composed, Sickness, Gender, and Belief in Early Modern England. Because Professor Weiser's career is in perpetual motion, um, I think we're incredibly fortunate to be able to have her join us today, and I'm delighted that she can, so I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming her properly as she um, begins to speak to us on patient agency and gender in pre-modern medicine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so thanks everybody. I'm I'm of the um, the camp. The this goes. This is not as new as we think it is. Camp that Jeremy Green mentioned this morning. Um, so my talk today looks at the long historical roots of disintermediation in healthcare. And before the 1800s, pati most patients diagnosed and treated themselves without the input of doctors. So there were plenty of healers, and we heard um, about some of the, the more learned kind of versions of those from Professor Wallace's talk. Um, but the market for cures was fairly unregulated, and patients did not always seek help from healers. So in addition, the, the prevailing understanding of medicine lent itself to disintermediation. So my talk today, I want to begin with just a brief introduction to early modern medicine and how it lent itself to patient agency. And then I want to offer a few examples of what this patient-centered healthcare system looked like. So in addition to revealing the long history of patients doing the work of doctors, I hope to show today how cultural factors were key to shaping patients' conceptions of health, and therefore how we think about disintermediation today. So we already had a brief overview, very brief of overview of the humors from Professor Wallace. Um, so I only will just recap them briefly for you here. But this was an understanding, this was a medical framework that was used to understand the body and it had an incredible longevity. So it lasted over 1500 years, largely because it was logical and it was adaptable um, and it was difficult to falsify. You could kind of come up with a humoral explanation for anything. So I'll just quickly explain what I mean. Um, so bodies were thought to be comprised of four fluids, humors. Each humor was comprised of two qualities, hot, dry, cold, wet, um, or hot or cold, wet or dry. The flows or emissions of these humors determined health. So health was fundamentally about intake and outgo. So if your body was open in constant flux with an easy ability to take stuff in and to purge stuff out, that was good. What was not good is if your body was clogged up if your humors were imbalanced, which we heard a little bit about from the, the earlier talk, or if your humors were corrupted. 
So these kinds of things could lead to illness. So humors were thought to exist in different qualities, in different um, in different proportions, in different people. Whoa, what's happening to the slides? So this was kind of like um, every person had their unique balance of humors, and this lent itself to kind of a pre-modern version of precision medicine that we've been talking about. So the humors were used, your kind of unique balance was used to describe your temperament, the kind of person you were. So sanguine, you might have a little more blood than the average bear. Melancholy means you have a little more black bile. Um, there's phlegmatic, I don't know why it's doing that, phlegmatic and choleric. So these are different kinds of temperaments or constitutions that were chalked up to your unique particular humoral balance. And of course we still use these words today, you know, uh, phlegmatic to some, someone that's slow or dull or melancholic, someone who's a little clout, you know, a little depressed. So the humors were used to describe or explain a range of bodily phenomenon beyond just health and temperament. Um, so in term, just to clarify, in terms of the precision medicine thing, you're, well, I'll come to that in a second. Never mind, I'll come back to it. So the humors were used to describe a whole bunch of bodily phenomenon. Sex differences, women were considered to be naturally a little cooler and wetter than men, which has some logic to it because plants grow in cool, wet places. The wrinkles and frailty of older people had to do with their dried up humors, they're cooler, drier humors. Babies were thought to be naturally warmer and wetter, which if anybody has held a baby, there is logic there. So the humors were used to describe, to account for temperament. They were used to account for age, seasonal variations. And then this brings us back to, to illness. So, um, and this idea of, of this pre-modern precision medicine. So Everyone had their own unique balance of humors, which could dictate kind of the, the, the kind of medical treatment you needed. And all, most of the remedies from the time had to do with unclogging clogged humors or rebalancing imbalanced humors or expelling corrupt humors. And this is why we have bleeding. Um, so removing blood, removing it from particular parts of the body. There's per a lot of herbal remedies would make you purge or you'd use an emetic. Um, there were topical remedies you'd put on your skin to create blisters, or you might scarify your skin and do cupping to pull out the corrupt humors through the blood. Um, uh, sudorifics were meant to create sweat, make you sweat out corrupt humors. And then this is an image of another form of remedy um, which is for wounds. So for a wound, you might put a dried pea or a small object here. It's an image of a ribbon in your wound to keep it open and flowing. And of course, this is one of my favorite examples because of course we today think of you know pus and blood coming out of a wound as not a good thing. But of course, this is a completely different framework for understanding how health works and what it means to be healthy. So seeing pus and corrupt matter coming out of your body, out of a wound meant you were healing, you were, you were, and you know, another kind of more obvious example is purging, right? We think of, of throwing up as a symptom that we, that means you're sick, but of course within this framework, purging was meant to be a good thing. It meant your body was trying to rebalance itself or expel corruption. Um, there was also something, you know, this is an age before obviously x-rays and CAT scans, and so being able to see the matter that came out of your body offered, it was valued, it provided insight into otherwise invisible bodily processes. So I wanted to pause here and discuss um, briefly how this medical system lent itself to patient authority. So uh, first, it provided a way of explaining and treating illness that everyone could understand. Practitioners possessed expert knowledge in the 1600s and the 1700s, which is generally the time period that I'm talking about. But patients and healers had more overlapping understandings of medicine than they do today, at least well, we're questioning that today in a bit, but um, overall. So today, generally, despite the, the kind of trends we're talking about over these two days, doctors' medical knowledge is distanced from that of patients by a vocabulary and an understanding of physical processes that patients tend to view as inaccessible. So patients and healers in the early modern period were on a more even playing field, uh, whereas today patients often use medicines without really knowing how they work, 
Some instances, we don't even feel them working. Early modern patients and healers had a shared understanding of the body and how medicines were presumed to operate. So, you know, the question I always get from students is, well, did this work, all the ble bleeding and purging? But within the framework that I've just introduced you to, drugs worked because patients could see and feel them do things to their bodies. They could see the blood coming out. They could see the pus flowing. Um, they were sweating. They were pooping. I promised I would talk about poop. Um, and so being able to see and feel drugs do something to their bodies is what was how they evaluated, how they kind of defined work, what works. So the second way um, the, the humoral framework lent itself to patient authority is in the role it gave to patient's words. How much sleep was the patient getting? How often did they urinate? What was she eating? And as we learned from Professor Wallace, these lifestyle choices were known as the six non-naturals and they were central to assessing health and treating illness. But patients knew them best. Patients knew best how to regulate their non-naturals in respect to their unique humoral makeups and environments. And so as a result, patients' own explanations of the non-naturals were key to medical, to, to understanding and diagnosing and treating illness. So patients' self-reported symptoms were also crucial to healthcare, and partly this is because there was no other way to get access to what was going on inside the body, um, but also diagnoses were largely dependent on patients' reported symptoms because diseases were not viewed as discrete biological entities that affected all bodies <clears throat> in uniform ways. So. Uh, diseases were viewed as ever-shifting clusters of symptoms that presented differently based on each person's unique humoral makeup, environment, and lifestyle choices. So in other words, two people who present with the exact same symptoms might be diagnosed with completely different diseases. Or conversely, two people with the same disease might present different symptoms. I know it's totally weird, but there was no sense of using objective bodily signs to understand illness. There was no sense that a disease would act the same way in all bodies. These are very modern notions, very modern ways of thinking about how disease works. So as a result, patients reported symptoms. What patients had to say about how they felt was key to making a diagnosis. So historians generally point to the mid-1800s as the time when this shared view of health among patients and healers began to break down. Um, you know, we started off this day talking about the big hospitals of the early 20th century, but, um, you know, from the patient's perspective, we might push the time frame back to the... The, the earlier 19th century. At this point, patients were no longer able to talk about their bodies in the same language as healers. Drugs began to work deep within the body's hidden processes where patients could not feel them and only medical experts could evaluate them. And patients were left to take blind faith in the professional status of physicians. Um, so I guess a larger question to think, you know, I guess what I'm offering here is like the pendulum swing, right? So if we if we see this is like this this early version of disintermediation and then we have this big shift from in the mid-19th century and now we're kind of swinging back again possibly um, today. So I wanted to devote the rest of my time today to talking about, to exploring this patient-driven healthcare system that I just very quickly introduced you to. And specifically, I want to offer some examples of how cultural factors helped to shape it. So the medical framework of humoralism definitely determined how patients understood illness, but so too did prevailing norms and beliefs. So I want to talk about three factors in particular. I want to talk about religion, gender, and writing conventions. And that last one's a little odd, but by writing conventions, it's, um, I mean the ways that patients documented their health. So the forms of written accounts, the genre conventions, the intended audiences, their motives for writing. And I want to suggest how these could actually determine how patients understood and perceived their bodies, their ailing bodies. So I'm a historian and my sources are um, different kinds of personal writing. So letters, spiritual diaries, account books. This is a more traditional diary, um, but as I want to hope to show in a moment, these Diaries are kind of hybrid texts. Um, they're not, they don't always kind of map on to what we think of as a diary or an account book. So this is written by a woman named Sarah Cooper. She was a very grumpy lady who lived in the 1700s in um, rural England. And she, her diary is over 2,000 pages long. And she is great. She's really beautiful, legible handwriting, thank goodness. 
So I wanted to start just to off I wanted to start by giving you some examples from some men, some male patients that I found. And so a pattern that I found reading lots of personal writing by male patients covered spanning the 17th century, the 1600s, I found that a considerable number of men from the period expressed pain and suffering by noting an inability to meet expectations of normative masculine behavior. So namely, fulfilling their occupational roles and responsibilities as governors of their households. So just to give a couple, just a little illustrative examples of what I mean, there was one uh, man who had a boil on his belly that he talks about how it did not hinder him from work, though painful enough, especially by obstructing my rest. This is an image of the famous uh, diarist Samuel Pepys, who wrote during the 1660s in London. Uh, he displayed fortitude when he injured his finger while hammering a nail. He applied a balsam, a kind of uh, solve to the wound, and he, though in great pain, yet went on with my business. In 1678, a man named Isaac Archer had a toothache and a room, which I'm now realizing I should probably, what, how do you describe a room in R-H-E-U-M? Like, um, it, see, but it's not an upper respiratory infection. It's not quite a cold, but I guess the symptoms of a cold, that's helpful. Yeah, like fl snot, phlegm, too much phlegm. Um, so he describes being like an old man for tenderness. So he was vulnerable, he was weak, he was incapable of eating, of studying, and most importantly, fulfilling his occupational obligations. So pain stripped away the key components of these guys' manhood. Uh, it diminished their virility, their strength, their livelihood. So I wanted to give a couple examples from another man from the period, Thomas Tilsley. He suffered from stomach aches, cold, gas, stone, and gout. Um, in the early 1700s, and he shares few details of these conditions other than the misery they <laughs> inflicted and his attempts to alleviate them. But what he does note is his varying gradations of debility alongside his recurring and transmuting pain. So he was a gentleman. He was living off of that. He was living off of his landed estates. He didn't have to work for a living. Um, so he doesn't refer to occupational obligations like I just was talking about. But like those other men I just mentioned. Incapacity is central to how he articulates his suffering. He notes it of its effects on his masculine traits of independency or independence rather and self-sufficiency. He also points to the second factor I wanted to talk about today, a second influence on how patients in this period understood and responded to illness, which is religion. So many men and women from the period chose to document their health for religious reasons as kind of a way of evaluating their progress toward heaven, which I argue um, has kind of skewed our understanding of the period because much of what is extant, much of what exists still is just stuff by really, really pious people. Um, Tilsley is, is one of my favorite uh, historical subjects because he's Catholic, which is, it's hard to find a lot of personal writing by Catholics living in England in this time period, which is the geographical focus of this project. And he believed pain was a redemptive act as a Catholic. He believed that it was atoning for his sin and enabling him to share in Christ's suffering. So pain and suffering was an act of penance of sorts for him. It was integral to salvation. And I think this context is important for understanding why um, Tildesley writes about debility the way he does. It was a devotional act. So another example um, is by a, just, I wanted to offer an example by a Protestant from the time period. Um, I mentioned Isaac Archer earlier. Um, he was also Protestant, but the Protestants tended to document their illnesses as a way of, um, they, they called it divine providences, as a way of kind of um, reading their bodies as signs from heaven, as tests from God. Um, to reflect on their spiritual progress. So Archer notes a subtler way that faith shaped his conception of illness. He describes his son's ability to quietly tolerate the torments of sickness on his deathbed. And this insensitivity to suffering demonstrated an ability to privilege the spiritual over the corporeal at the all-important moment of God's judgment. And there was actually a whole genre of literature at the time that taught believers these lessons. It was known as the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, and these are just two examples of many, many others of this genre. And the, the idea was that how you behaved on your deathbed in your final moments indicated whether or not you were going to heaven. And this, I suggest, influenced how Archer understood his son's illness. Death was imminent, but Archer found solace in the fact that he, he wrote, his boy felt nothing. Peering at his gaunt, convulsing son, Archer expressed, quote, fear he should have come to himself and felt those pains which, with grief, we saw. 
So Archer was certain that his son, his body, the body of his son was racked by pain, but he reasoned that his son was senseless. This is an image from another popular book from the period that served as a key model for believers like Archer. This book is colloquially known as the Book of Martyrs by John Fox, and it was filled with images like this of Protestant martyrs who were burning at the stake under the reign of Catholic Mary Tudor. And this book was incredibly popular. A lot of the um, copies of it that we have today have holes in the punched through them because they were actually chained <coughs> to the pews of churches. And even illiterate people would have known these images. It was incredibly widespread, this, this book. They wouldn't have been able to own this book, but they would, have been, they would have seen these images. And these martyrs were upheld as models of heroic suffering. They responded to their bodily torture with calmness and courage because their thoughts and hearts were focused on heaven. So I've found that believers like Archer describe their suffering in similar terms, or in this instance, the suffering of his son. He believed his son's pain actually existed, but the boy could not feel it, because to die well was to die stoically like a martyr with thoughts on heaven. So these accounts are further informed by the third kind of factor I wanted to talk about today, writing conventions. So Archer was clearly writing within a religious frame. Tildesley, the gentleman I talked about who was the Catholic man, um, was keeping a diary as a record of social concerns but also business matters. So this is an image of one page of his writing and you can see um, how he kind of draws the, the line down the right, right hand side of the page and is tabulating those zeros are um, tabulations, monetary tabulations. He's kind of keeping track of money that's owed to him or who he's paying. So I think that this kind of writing helps contextualize another pattern that I found in men's writing from the time, which was a tendency to view illness in quantifiable terms. So next to the details of the weather and his day-to-day -day social engagements, Tilsley's making tabulations of every pence spent. One entry from 1714 notes the company he kept, but also the cost of each item he purchased that day. And his accounts of debility are similarly kind of quantifying. They're, they're relying on similar quantifications. So a few days later, he developed a headache and began taking purgatives. He calculated the number of times the pills loosened his bowels, only purged two or three times and once a <coughs> night. The following day, he was, quote, very uneasy with the grips, like stomach cramps, and three pur purging stools per diem and two per night. So I think that his hybrid diary account book facilitated this kind of quantifying. The, I also wanted to just give the historic, you know, the non-historians a sense of the kind of stuff that we, we at least pre-modern people do, <laughs> read really weird handwriting. Um, so, or I guess those of you working on doctors also have to read really weird handwriting. <laughs> so the men who wrote diaries to record spiritual concerns also seem to use their personal writing to document business matters. So this is a page from a wig maker who kind of worked part time as he wasn't a surgeon, but he did like bleeding and cupping on the side. Um, from Manchester, and he recorded spiritual lessons and fretted about his impious behavior, mostly his drinking. But the bulk of his diary concentrated on the number of wigs he sold, and he was also a part-time secondhand book dealer. Um, so he was quantifying wigs sold, books sold. And this is a transcription of just a little chunk of his diary to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Here he's expressing um, his spiritual anxieties. He notes missing private prayers once and public prayers twice. So he's quantifying his like spiritual religious lapses. And he quotes the Bible when he says at the end, all the world or all attempts at worldly gain is vanity. But the entry's primary focus on work seems to dwarf these concerns. For men like Harold and like Tildesley, self-writing provided an important means of documenting <coughs> spiritual concerns, but also tabulating business ventures and expenditures. So terse quantifiable accounts of illness reflect the intentions and conventions of this writing. As tabulations of daily minutiae rather than realms for self-expression, these men's diaries, I think, lent themselves to quantifying illness. So I want to now turn um, to women's perceptions of health and offer a couple um, examples from that group of sources before I conclude. So one pattern I found um, is that whereas men tended to quantify looking to their own bodies as barometers of health, women tended to compare tended to compare their illnesses to other people. They looked to the illnesses of others to diagnose and gauge the severity of their own. One woman compared her illness to a cousin's. The original of her illness, only a cold in her head, a room, now we know, caused the same effects as fell to me in my head. Or during a bout of fever, a woman named Elizabeth Freak, 
F-R-E-K-E, compared herself to her maid and her cousin. And, you know, I know some of you are thinking, well, probably it's because they were contagious. And that could have been the case, um, but that doesn't explain all of this because I found this pattern again and again in women's writing, even when it involved chronic ailments that were not viewed as contagious or infectious. So how do we explain this? One way of explaining it is to contextualize it in women's lives. So many of the women in this era did work that involved maintaining and caring for bodily related concerns. They cared for children. They worked as food preparers, as servants. They had jobs as healers, as wet nurses, as watchers, who would, whose job was just to watch the sick, as searchers who would go door to door and calculate how many people were dying and from what. Midwives, layers out of the dead. We saw um, an image of that in one of Professor Wallace's slides. So perhaps the way women conceptualized illness was grounded in the social particulars of women's lives and work. And of course, many women did work that it did not involve bodies at all. But I argue that pre prevailing representations of women in their work, like this slide or like this slide, showed women doing the work of he healing, bearing, nursing, feeding, watching, and rearing other bodies. And several women I found took this even further. They not only made sense of illness by looking to others, but they seemed to physically embody the ailments of others, as though their grief and sorrow for their loved ones transposed, transposed illnesses from other bodies onto their own. So we already learned that emotions were believed to have physical effects on bodies. These passions were one of the six non-naturals. Men and women alike attributed illness to emotional upheaval like fear or surprise or grief, but this phenomenon of seeming to embody the ailments of others um, via their grief or fear, I found only expressed by women. I found 17 examples of this um, in all, none by men. So just returning to Elizabeth Freak, uh, she offers an example of what I'm talking about. Her husband, Percy, developed dropsy or what we would call edema in 1706. This image is way too late and it's way too German, but I needed to find an image of the edema for you guys, of dropsy. So his leg and stomach swelled, it broke out in sores, he excreted an extraordinary amount of fluid, he had to sleep upright in a chair for months, and Freak cares for her husband throughout the ordeal. She, noticed, she notes the physical toll of her constant attendance, which led to her very ill condition. And she compares her symptoms to those of her husband, who also happened to be her cousin. Different, hmm. That's a different talk. My left leg swelled and broke likewise, but not as my dear cousins did. So she noted her leg was swelling a little bit differently, but she's clearly no, kind of uh, understanding her ailment in relation to his. She suffered from two great holes in her leg that excreted fluid in a manner that was eerily similar to Percy's dropsy, and she reckoned that her swellings, like her husband's, were fatal. And other women I found also similarly endured bodily disorders that seemed to mirror those of ailing loved ones, which I call sympathetic suffering. So one woman noted that the sight of her husband's fatal convulsion fits was so very terrible to me that after his death, I fell into very ill fits myself. And another described how her bowels quake to see my dear son so indisposed with shaking fits. So falling sick in harmony with loved ones reflected prevailing ideas about women's bodies. Women, th women were thought to be humorly cooler and moister than men. Um, their bodies were often referred to as spongy. So the, this constitution made their flesh more porous, more impressionable. So there's kind of a physiological explanation for this. They were thought to be particularly vulnerable to the effects of the passions. But in addition to this explanation, proper feminine behavior and emotional expression determine these accounts. Actually contracting the diseases of dying husbands and ailing children enabled women to display abounding sympathy, pity, and love, these effective responses that society expected of them. And then my final example um, is looking to, again, writing conventions as a way of making sense of this pattern, of the pattern more generally of why women are looking to other bodies to make sense of their own. So it was common in this period for women and men to keep recipe books like this, to store medical know-how and treat illnesses at home. So men did this kind of writing too, but whereas men wrote about health in many other genres, medical treaties, account books, recipe books are one of the only ways that literate women wrote about health in this period. And the ways women documented household medicine in recipes, I think, suggests another way they learned to look to other bodies to understand their own. 
because the production and circulation of lay medical knowledge and recipe books taught sufferers to, to define their ailments in relation to other people. So here's just a close-up from this book. Um, recipes are valued by their efficacy, which was confirmed by an author's name written in the margin there or the phrase probatum est, it is proven, which affirms the remedy was tried and it worked. So you can see here the names in the margins. She, um, This book is by Anne Fanshawe, so the A Fanshawe is her name, and then above it is Sir Kenelm Digby. This is the name of the person, who, where, the book where she, where she got the recipe. And then you, the ones that didn't work, you can see the huge X cross. She's pretty clear when she doesn't like the recipe. And I think those little Xs are also efficacious like efficacy marks that she she tried it. So this way of documenting and sharing medical know-how taught women to conceive of illness in relation to others. Assigning authorship, naming someone who benefited from a recipe proved its worth and provided the means by which others evaluated their own ailments. When Elizabeth Hastings learned that her sister-in-law was sick, she penned a letter almost entirely <laughs> devoted to the healing properties of snail water, which yes, included snails. She included a receipt for preparing the recipe. She even sent a <laughs> bottle of it in the post so that her sister could make a trial of it. And she, you know, told her how to take, you take it with spa water once a week, etc, etc. So Hastings listed the people she knew who also found the snail water effective. Lady Ramston, from whom I had it, uh, had it as known surprising, wait, Lady Ramston, from whom I had it, has known surprising cases in wastings of the flesh. And my sister Anne's servant, Miss Dove, is one instance who I believe would not have been alive but for it. So the communal production, circulation, and validation of household medicine taught sufferers to assess their ailing bodies by looking to the experience of experiences of others. So just as others' words and lives and experiences verified a recipe, they helped these women determine the nature, severity, and progression of illness. So I will stop there. These are not the only patterns I found. I could talk much longer about this. These are not the only explanations for the patterns that I found. Um, but what I, I hope my talk has illuminated the long historical roots of disintermediation in medicine. And the stories I've told today I know may seem too distant or too foreign to be relevant, but I urge you to view that distance and foreignness <coughs> as valuable. I think looking at an era so long ago and so unlike our own gives us much needed critical perspective, that we're able to see our own experiences with new clarity. We're able to see how something as seemingly absolute as a human body is historically contingent, that the ways we understand our body and physically feel our bodies changes over time. So thinking of illness as a mutating cell or um, as a genetic defect or in the instances of the people I've talked about today as a humoral clog can physically can affect how we physically perceive our bodies, not just how we understand them, but how we live in them, how we embody them, and how we communicate with others. So these frameworks also, these medical frameworks also explain how patients bec can become empowered to, to do the work of healing themselves, which maybe is something, you know, we can come back to in our conversations. But also, uh, I hope to have shown today that when we talk about disintermediation, we must account not only for medical frameworks, but also a host of unspoken cultural scripts that give form and meaning to patients' views and behaviors. So cultural beliefs and assumptions that we often take to be subjective or culturally constructed, they're learned and unconsciously reproduced in the ways that we comport ourselves and the ways that we navigate our world. Yet they become viewed as objective medical truths when they're substantiated in the lived experiences of our bodies. And I think it's easier to recognize that phenomenon when we're looking at a time and place that's largely unfamiliar to us. We can see how ideas about men and women's social roles, about how we communicate health concerns, or about our spiritual beliefs, how they can become absorbed and validated and reproduced in the lived realities of our ailing bodies. And I think that might be one of the most important historical lessons we have. So thank you. And I, I, might have, <clears throat> I might have missed this, but I was just wondering, do you have a sense of, um, obviously if people are literate, we're talking about a certain class of woman who can, um, is that one of your plans? <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering if there are other ways of getting, first of all, if we actually do have a sense of who, how many classes are, are doing this, you know, is it just obviously we have to talk, we can write, but how far down do we go? And otherwise, how... Do they bring in the stories of women who might not be literate in this sort of communication of who does what, or are they really just referring to experiences of people who are sort of on their level? 
Who's they? Oh, I'm sorry, the women, when they're, when they're referring to... When they're referring to other people? Yeah. Um, so your question is, are they ref is there a class dimension to who they're referring to? So it's kind of a two-part question. Okay. So the first part is, you know, clearly there's a certain class only that can actually record right. this information. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sort of wondering if, you know, on one hand, if we really are only getting that picture, or mm -hmm. if through this and through the communication of someone else said, we can actually get it, what, if there are actually class differences that we can get it. Yeah. I mean, the class issue is a, is a problem, um, because obviously the story I told you today is based on people who were literate, who wrote stuff down. And um, a lot of what I was trying to get at is also how what people write down is skewed right by their belief system and by what they're writing um, so I've tried to get around it by looking at different kinds of historical sources to access the bodies of the the words of the poor the words of people who didn't write and I did that by looking at petitions that paupers wrote to government officials asking for help basically people applying for welfare like the early modern version of it um, and there are problems with those sources too they're formulated they're legal documents they're mediated but what I found is that the social social class, what we would call social class, really does matter. That the concerns that are affecting someone who is impoverished, that the, the kind of cultural scripts, the phrase I was using today, weren't really about gender and religion. Um, they didn't have the luxury of worrying about these things. They were about duty and you know um, whether they're deserving of support and about ability and disability. So I found that class is incredibly important in terms of how um, it shapes the ways people, in this period at least, think about illness. Um, and it's, it's always a problem. And how do we recover the voices of people who didn't, who didn't write? Um, so it's a great question. Am I supposed to call on people? Or is, I mean, we can do I it can. together if we want. Okay, so let's do it together. Two, three, yes. <laughs> um, I'm so fascinated by the, um, the recipe books and just the gender dimension of, of how that expertise is developed. It's like the early goop. It's early <laughs> the culture. Um, and I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and I mean, I'm trying, I don't know how to think about it as, it's a form of disintermediation, but yeah. I'm also just curious about, I think Professor Wallace talked about pharmaceuticals and how that was an, a lay expertise that was present in, in recipe books as well. It was there, were there recipes for Drugs and oh, treatments like that. Okay, so yeah, that's what these are. Recipes for drugs. I can't read that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can't read that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just thought everyone could read that. It's against the biting of a mad dog, taught by Kenelm Digby. And it's I love all almost all recipe books include recipes for how to cure a bite of a by a mad dog, which I just think is great. So I just included that one. Um, but yeah, they're full. They're they're really interesting documents because they're they combine culinary recipes with medical recipes and cosmetic recipes. Often all combined. Sometimes they're <coughs> sectioned out. Um, and I'm not. I mean, there are other historians who've just devoted their lives to studying these documents. I just dabble in them. But they're absolutely a, a great example, perfect example of disintermediation <coughs> and the, the how robust and prevalent it was, um, especially in the pre-modern era. I'd like to, again, uh, talk about the recipes a little Sure. More. And I'd like to sort of challenge the idea that this is, well, I, you know, it certainly is a form of medical literature that women get into heavily, especially from 1500 onwards. But it's fundamentally a uh, medieval academic uh, genre. It's called experimentum, <coughs> or experimenta, which is a tried and true remedy that is not necessarily based on the logic of Galenic uh, qualities, but which is validated by the reputation of the doctor. Arnold Villanova published a famous collection of them, or by the status of the person who was healed by them. Arnold of Villanova has a big book of his experiment, his tried and true. Uh, medical remedies. He said, I tried this on, you know, a cardinal so-and-so, or the groom of the Pope. You know, in other words, he names the, uh, it's validated by the status of the person that, that it worked on. And it strikes me that, that and Fanshawe's recipes work exactly, they're what's called secrets, or experimenta. Um, in this case, it's the recipe for a mad dog, taught by Sir Kendall Digby. In other words, she got it from Kendall Digby's mm -hmm. collection. Uh, recipes, which in turn were derived from, uh, uh, you know, printed sources and, and other places too. Kenelm Digby was pretty eclect eclectic. So there's a kind of commerce, mm -hmm. so to speak. And, and Fanshawe passes her remedies 
onto other people. So the remedy becomes a kind of intellectual and cultural currency mm -hmm. that flows around, but also up and down between the academic and the and the vernacular level. It becomes not so much, I think, goop as the internet. You know, it, it becomes the uh, it, uh, it operates in that kind of um, I think much more um, Open like crowdsourcing, you mean? Like open sourced software? It's open, it's open source. It's open source <laughs> medicines, but it's also based on authority. And Fanshawe is basing herself on the authority. Kendall Digby, Kendall Digby is probably placing, make, you know, well, deriving yeah. from printed books uh, uh, secrets, which in turn go back to, you know, Arnold Villanova or whoever. I think it's a little more, I think it's a little messier than that. I totally yeah. see what you're saying. Um, because, of course, Anne Fanshawe is not writing down Kenelm Digby's recipe word for word. So yeah. a lot of, and yeah. a lot of the way that works, that process works, is it gets adapted and tested. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my colleague Elaine Leong just came out with a wonderful book that I just finished reading yeah. that looks at how these recipes were ways of testing out knowledge. So you wouldn't see this kind of linear progression of like Kenelm Digsby's recipe gets recreated here and then it's passed down to Anne Fanshawe's daughter and then it's passed it right that each step that we see in these recipe books how compilers are actually augmenting and testing and changing and then of course the recipe right below that is my lady my lady bevel bettles so with that I don't know who that is it might be her neighbor it's an unpublished source so alongside the literate or even learned recipes, we get recipes that maybe the compiler made up, maybe they heard, and they become these kind of mixed. Yeah, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can give recipes to people as a form of culture. Absolutely, exchange. yeah. Uh, Peter, like uh, the Peter snail Jones's water. Work on, the snail water. On, yeah, on, 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 on uh, what's his name? Fairford, the doctor in Devon in the 15th century, who got recipes from his upmarket patients. Lady Poimings gave him. Of the doctor. Yeah, recipe, there's lots which of. She records. There are a lot of recipes as coming from. Yeah. From his his uh, his wealthy his wealthy patient. Yeah, there's lots of evidence of recipes going in the other direction too. Yeah, and but, he sold a recipe yeah. to a surgeon in London. You know, so recipes. I are clearly really, should have just talked about recipes yeah. the whole time. No, <laughs> it, 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 recipes are really, I think complicated. Um, there's a social life of the recipe. Yeah. Which is really intriguing. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Jeremy. Oh, did you still want to ask the question? So yeah, so thanks, thanks for the question. I, I, um, I, I, I guess, you know, like, linger on Peeps for a, for a moment, right? So, so Peeps, I mean, I actually, I have a Twitter feed of Peeps. I don't know what? I yeah, know. yeah. Oh, oh, Peeps, Pe Pe it's not you behind it. A day. No, no, I, I don't <laughs> Yeah, the, I the diary. Thing, I bit, yeah, I get that too. Um, and, you know, but Peeps became also a favorite figure for the quantified self movement, right? Mm -hmm. And so yep. here's I'm asking you kind of not just about anachronistic uses of peeps, right? But this <laughs> idea of as we try and think of what are <coughs> the conceptual and technological bases whereby 21st century patients see a form of empowerment of returning to this peeps like moment of, of taking a kind of an active agency in control of recording physiologically important things to them. Um, I'm interested in asking how you see the contemporary use of peeps to justify oh, what is really a 21st century moment, but then also maybe asking that question in the opposite way, which is to say, well, you know, if, if there's a variety of technologies that undergird this new quantified self moment, either people getting access to their data and charting them yeah. on their own, yeah. or as sort of the work of anthropologist Natasha Dauschel, who has been looking at how newer wearable text like the Fitbit are actually culturally almost opposed to the quantified self. They appear to give you a lot of data about yourself, but what they do, do is function as more of a compass than a graph. That it's more about the interface designing the nudge so that people don't actually take the action of doing all the calculate. You wear a Fitbit not so that you can do all the calculations yourself, but so you don't have to, and it will buzz you until you just stand up and walk around, right? Um, and, and so the, the idea that given technology can move in both directions. So I wonder, yeah. on, on some level, what, what are the technologies that allowed peeps and others to, and if you're thinking more in the masculine vein that you're describing, to actually quantify their own physiologies? 
Um, I haven't thought about it in terms of technologies, yeah. but I would argue for peeps, a lot of it, I mean, I'm, a lot of my analytical work has been on writing, yeah. and that I think a lot of it has to do with the, the genre of writing, the impulse to write, the kind of people who wanted to spend time writing about themselves, and, like, you have to be pretty self-focused to do the kind of self, to do the kind of writing that Pepys did, the, just the quantity of it and the self-focused nature of it. He also was a member of the Royal Society, so he was not learned at all, but he was going to, he was like observing dissections and like watching Robert Boyle do experiments. And um, he had a kidney stone removed and got, bought a beautiful silk case for it and looked at it and had a feast to honor it every year on the day of his kidney stone operation. So he had a, he was a very, unique figure in that he was pretty self-obsessed and self-focused <laughs> on his own body. And I think some of it had to do with the culture of the Royal Society and when he was living, and some of it had to do with his proclivity to write. Mm -hmm. um, and I, ha I hadn't thought about it in terms of technology. But, I mean, the, the flip side about today, I'd have to think about, you guys probably know more than me about the technologies of today, I would think Twitter or like these social media platforms that encourage us to boil down our how we're doing or what we're feeling into 140 characters or to use emojis um, that these kinds I think that these do shape the way we think about our states of being probably in ways you know I'm just thought about this for five seconds but um, the same way that you would tend to count your stools because you keeping an account book that you know like that I think these things really do seep into the ways we kind of identify ourselves and think about our our states um, I mean, the yeah. question broadly, thinking along as you're answering this, like that, that a paper technology is every bit of technology. Yeah, as yeah. As possible. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a sense in which that the, quantif the quantificatory impulse, right, is not something that was necessarily always transhistorically there in diary keeping at home, right? Right. So you're describing a, a sort of an, you know, an epistemic genre in the making of deciding it's worth counting all these things. And, and that, that, so that, that idea of like, well, at what point does something, like, the, does the technology of a book or the ability of having a ledger and doing book taking begin to inculcate certain thought practices? Um, right. And, and, and I guess the question I have is, is that as gendered as, as you're making it actually here? And I'm thinking a little bit about, I mean, I, it just, it just to just reach for something that, you know, a lot of people in this room would know, the, uh, you know, Martha Ballard in The Midwife's Tale, that, there's a very strong impulse towards quantifying in her diary as well, her inner 18th century diary, which right. serves many it's an account books, book. like Tilsley does the right. account book. Yeah. And I guess if I'm wondering, you know, is the quantifying impulse, are you looking at a moment in which it happens to be more gendered and then it becomes less gendered later on? Or are you looking at a place where it happens to be more gendered? Um, what's the I process think, which counting? I think, and I think if women like ba if there were more people like Ballard keeping account books, I my guess is that yeah. women would be doing it too. My my take is that we see more quantifying in writing by men from the period because more men were keeping these hybrid account book diaries. And then my argument is that I think that then affects how they think about their bodies. That how we write about and think about and talk about and tweet about our bodies affects how we perceive our bodies, right? That then they start to think about their health in terms of how many purges and how many. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily like women didn't count, um, but that because these so many men were doing this kind of writing and using it as a way to tabulate their health or to evaluate or keep track of their, document their health, that it then kind of seeps into, how, into their perceptions. Yeah. Well, of course, Peeps wouldn't be tweeting because he wrote in cryptography. His diary is all in a secret shorthand, which nobody deciphered until the early 20th century. So it's not for public. But it was very easily but cracked. Also, <laughs> it was not a very hard code. One of the things that a, a, uh, a well-trained uh, uh, lady of the elite classes would do in the, this period was to cast accounts. She would keep the household account books. But the household account books are separate from, they're not a personal diary. Right. The man, as it were, owns the money. The woman only, as it were, manages it from the, the, the household perspective. So yeah. you know, even though she does cast accounts, she, she does it, as it were, at arm's length from her, her personal. 
Yeah, and so what I've found is, so when I'm reading these diaries that aren't at all account books by men, they're counting their per, they're doing all this quantifying, <laughs> and um, I just don't, I just couldn't find it. Not women, yeah. I couldn't find a single woman who talks about her poop, but I, a lot of men talk about their poop. <laughs> Separate, different talk, but no, maybe it is this talk. <laughs> um, I promised I would talk about poop. So one, one of the things I really like about the way you presented the joke for today for this conference, right, is that you have, in theory, one you know, paper technology of this intermediation, like the, the diary, right? Which is, you know, on some level has always been available and yet is newly available, right? With an increasingly literate population of cheaper paper and so on. Um, and yet it's being used in very different ways as you're, as, you're, as you're teasing apart using this kind of first split of gender. And I guess what I'd want to ask you as well is what other forms <coughs> of stratification of ways in which not all, um, you know, not all citizens, not, not even going back to this language of democratization, right? There's not sort of an even way in which all people would use a technique like this. You're showing one cut, one, one, one polarity. What are the other kinds of strata of cuts that you would look at? We've already mentioned that class is a problem because mm -hmm. of the sampling device. But what other ways of looking at difference can you, can you get out of these materials? Or might you, might you speculate on Oh. Mar uh, marital status, age, um, religion, race. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It will, but yes. I mean, and I think, I mean, it's hard because I was trying to, I didn't want to get into it and bore everybody who's not into history, but um, the, these documents are really complicated because they're not just diaries. They're not private diaries the way we, you know, we think of this, we have this image of a diary where you write in secret and maybe like, you, you have a little lock and no one reads it and but that's not at all what these were like these were semi-public documents um, they were meant to be passed down they were sometimes written to posterity so it's also hard to talk you know a lot of the documents I used I showed you some images of straight up what we think is straight up diary but this is actually really a spiritual journal also um, and then of course the Tildesley diary is more obviously this kind of hybrid so it's also hard to think about these documents, like, in the kind of, it doesn't make sense, they don't map onto our kind of contemporary genres. But yeah, in terms of slicing them up, I mean, any kind of um, way we would, I mean, what are some other ways we would think about this? Those are the, those are the ways that I've thought about it. Um, class, gender, religion, marital status. I haven't quite done age because they just don't have enough to get a good, um, but I think, you know, maybe it's something to think about in the when we, you know, over the course of the next day and a half is, you know, how we're, when we take the, when we're thinking about the patient's perspective, how these different factors really are shaping the ways the disintermediation plays out, the ways they're kind of making sense of the knowledge they gain from Google or the information they get from Google, the ways um, th that clinical encounter, the ways a, a patient might skirt a doctor or take or try to treat themselves using the internet um, that there are these kind of cultural factors that I think are really shaping how we as patients think about our bodies and think about health I don't know what which other ones I'm missing George um, thank you that was a very interesting talk have you thought at all about the rise of the genre itself the diary it seems to me that there's a whole story there yeah. that goes well beyond healthcare. Um. Yeah, um, I've thought about it. <laughs> yeah, it is a fairly new genre of writing at the time, and a lot of the people who've written about the rise of the genre are more literary scholars. Um, so I tend to just not get into that can of worms, basically. Um, so, I mean, I've thought about it in terms of kind of think, thinking critically about the genre and what it's doing, what's motivating people to write it, um, what are the kind of, what are the, the, the written forms that existed out there at the time that were affecting how, that were kind of teaching people how to keep a diary, how to write. A lot of the people that, the diaries that I've been able to find for this period um, they're mostly religious. They're they're really they're really informed by religious views and by religious texts and kind of literature that teaches people how to document their spiritual progress. Um, Is this coming from Lutherans, Catholics? Or 
Wh where is this coming from? This religious uh, uh, recording, this recording of, of moral and religious. Uh, <coughs> it's mostly what I meant, as I mentioned in the talk, it's mostly Protestant, um, that a lot of the kind of push to record your day-to-day -day life every sniffle every sneeze you got to write it down as like a the pil uh, like pilgrim's progress as a way of documenting your journey um it was mostly a, a protestant kind of uh spiritual exercise and so as i mentioned very briefly that's really skewed how we understand people who've written historians who are interested in the patient in the history of the patient using at least english records have tended to tell a pretty skewed story because so much of the extant literature is by Protestants who are not writing to write about their health necessarily, they're writing to write about their spiritual progress. And by extension, we get some information about how patients wrote about their health. So I've tried in this project to rebalance the view by trying to find people like Tildesley, try to find Catholics, and try to find people who cover a broader range of the kind of spectrum of Protestant denominations or you know confessional affiliations to try to kind of offer a more balanced view. Is, is there a French equivalent to the rise of the diary? Is there a what? A French equivalent to the rise of the diary. Um, you mean within Catholicism or? Well, within France, which would include Catholicism. I'm not sure. I would but, imagine. But, I mean, it would also include Huguenots and so. I would imagine so. Um, but I don't know French. I haven't read French diaries, um, but I would guess, guess. I would guess. Can I ask it? Because that's very, totally new stuff to me. Sure. But I found myself profoundly sympathetic to these people. They seemed absolutely modern to me. They could be my patients, or they could be my friends, they could be myself. There's, I'm, I feel absolutely, <coughs> in, I mean, of course, certain of the assumptions of the nature of science and medicine vary, but the motivations <coughs> and the, the attempts to, to improve themselves or to, and to understand what's happening to them and the, they, that, I, what, what, wouldn't people be writing diaries just like that right now, for example, mm. except for the differences in, you know, the various parts that interest you, which is how culture was different in that time and, and this time, but the human endeavors and the efforts and the thoughtfulness and the introspection and the attempts to learn about oneself through um, observing and recording, right? That's, that's happening right now, isn't it? Or not? It, it could be. I mean, you could do this a similar kind of anthropologic, you, you could do the same kind of study using diaries today if you could skirt HIPAA regulations. But um, absolutely, I think, I mean, that's, I don't see why not. I think, you know, there are tons of ways that you would have a different, very different story to tell. But absolutely, the, the overarching kind of concerns that were uh, affecting these people are transhistorical in a way. Thomas? And thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, well, I have two questions, I guess. The first is really a comprehension question. You said at one point that um, the idea of a disease is a kind of an objective entity that affects different people. This is fundamentally modern. But then in the examples of some of the women and then this comparison with the illness of the sister, uh, I'm just wondering, does that not go in the direction of a kind, of, kind of finding out this essential disease? And if, if not, why not? Um, and then the second question is maybe a comment uh, just about this idea of sympathetic suffering. And it made me think of um, other work that's been done on more relational aspects of human existence in philosophy, for example, um, that don't, maybe they were, they were articulated first by women, but don't always apply to women. So, so for example, the idea of relational autonomy, um, today you can say, okay, autonomy is fundamentally relational. My autonomy depends on the autonomy of others. And I'm wondering if you could make, or you'd be willing to entertain the idea of a parallel argument here where you can say health is fundamentally <coughs> relational. Um, what you see in this example of sympathetic suffering is the idea that my own health doesn't have much meaning in the absence of the health of others. Yeah, um, that's how I frame it. Yeah, is that health. I think was relational for men and women alike. It's just how the relate, you know, the relationships unfold differently. The emphasis, the emphases differ, and the kind of point, 
so the you know the sympathetic the these women are thinking about their illnesses relationally to others and it's this kind of instant transposition of like others ailments onto their own bodies it seems um, whereas with men the examples I gave you it's also relational I mean they're they're thinking about their their bodies in relation to to work and their occupations to the credit economy to things that are also relational um, they're just not other people so I would frame it that way if, if that makes sense um, as absolutely relational and that it's a difference of kind of emphasis um, the first question about diseases being uniform, yeah, so there were some, dis there were, the, the idea that there were diseases or ailments that m pe everyone could have existed. So you could have an ague and you could have an ague or you could have a room and you could have a room. Um, so there were, there was the idea that there were discrete diseases, what we would call diseases. There were just very, very, very few of them, not nearly as many as we would have just like you could, like 12 I mean there just weren't that many disease categories um, and the ways that your room <coughs> presents would be different from the way my room would present so the fact that freak is looking to other people or the, those women were looking to other people and seeing their you know trying to make sense and evaluate their own illnesses by looking to others was compatible with this idea that diseases were not uniform necessarily you could have the same disease but it might present differently in you because you're a little sanguine or because you're from you know you're from Vienna and I'm from or whatever wherever you know the, the where you're from your humoral makeup these all can kind of affect how the disease presents in your body so if that helps explain that it you can you can look to someone else to understand your illness and it can still be um, viewed as this very unique experience. Thomas and Faith, you both had questions, and then should we call for break? Um, yes, I'm wondering if it makes sense to use expert uh, expertise or expert authority uh, to discuss uh, your examples. Uh, so, is it possible to describe what's happening as the creation of, of a particular kind of expertise that is based on personal experience, uh, on experience of others, but also on, on the literature, just to, to put it in the category that we're also using today for, uh, yeah. to link it up to today's discussion. Is, would that work? Expertise um, as a category? Or? I guess it depends on how we define expertise. I mm. mean, if we're defining it as the kind of elite, you know, are we defining it as learned, as the kind of gold standard that Professor Wallace was talking about, as something where that requires um, theory as opposed to just empirical knowledge? So this again comes back to the points from the medieval, the talk about medieval medicine. Um, having basing your ideas about how health works on empiricism was considered to be lowly, not as expert, not as valuable as having ancient uh, traditional medical theory to kind of undergird what you're saying. So I guess it depends on how we define it. But I think if we define it really broadly as just the knowledge of medical professionals, then yes. I mean, the, the, this is a time when the, the, it was a much more kind of horizontal relationship um, and I know that we're arguing that it's becoming that way now with this intermediation, but that the, the shared knowledge base was much broader. And it wasn't just about Googling and getting the information. It was a shared, fundamentally, a, a shared understanding of how bodily processes work, how to evaluate drugs, how to diagnose, how to make sense of your six non-naturals, how to um, think about the progression of your illness, that these were much more overlapping you know, ways of thinking about, about medicine than we have even today with the internet. Um, I know, I know I, you know, when I'm teaching this stuff, I often say, it's just, you know, it, I often make the comparison that I'm trying to make right now, which is, it's like the internet, you know, like, you can just, the, you know, you watch an ad for the little purple pill, and then you want to go buy it, and that it is very easy to make that link. Um, but I think the, the overlaps were much more fundamental than they are today, in terms of just in knowledge. Um, so if we define it that way, then yes, I guess expertise would work. I guess that's how you define it. What do you think? Yeah, and if I could take the expertise uh, <coughs> and turn it in another way, which I think 
uh, addresses the theme of disintermediation that we're talking about today. I'm wondering about whether we're seeing a seismic shift in the change in the attitudes of physicians themselves towards their patients' writing. Osler, we've mentioned his name many times today, once said, and not ironically, that uh, he always groaned inwardly when a patient arrived for an appointment with a written list of his symptoms, because he knew he was dealing with a neurotic and a troublemaker, mm -hmm. uh, and somebody who was, you know, essentially out to diagnose himself, and he didn't like that. And I think about my own experience just a few years ago, where my doctor wanted me to keep a daily record of my blood pressure for something like three months, and then you know fax it into her before my next appointment. So mm -hmm. I was given the task, as it were, of keeping a diary. Uh, and I wonder whether disintermediation is also changing the way in which physicians, and I'd like to address the physicians in the room, think about what their patients might write or how their patients might, um, you know, the, the patient's act of recording or uh, inscribing, as it were, their own, uh, their own experience. Any, any words from the MDs? Well, I, I, I think it kind of varies, it varies across the board as well. And oftentimes, this is part of what I'm leaning on this context of stratification. So mm -hmm. if you look at, say, Elliot Joslin, who has the you know, leading diabetes uh, physician in the 20th, 20th century, you know, before and after the onset of insulin, works very closely with his patients, has them keep diaries. These diaries are actually very well preserved, you know, preserved in archives. The historian physician Chris Huebner attends mm -hmm. extensively about this. And it's very clearly tied to a moral scale that Joslin sets up. Joslin very famously gives medals to patients who actual medal casted metals for patients who managed to keep their their you know, their their the, the, the recorded physiological attributes within desirable ranges. But it's based on a recognition that when you're working with when you're when you've chosen to work with a, a population over a long term of a chronic illness, that the control that happens within the clinic or the hospital just has to be seeded or remapped into a domestic space. And so the diary becomes so I think, or is, I think you can still find in the 21st century many physicians expressing that contemporary version of those sentiment, you know, groaning about the burden of dealing with patients who come in with their own lists and diaries. But so it, it depends on where you're looking, right? If the diary yeah. is an assignment given by the physician, it's okay. If the diary is something produced by the patient spontaneously, I mean, it's one way of looking at it. Certainly, Jocelyn operated in a pretty paternal model, but I, I also think that. For Jocelyn, the, the diary and the, the patient as an active agent of recording and, and monitoring themselves was crucial to the to the possibility of helping to make diabetes a manageable illness. But it also has to do with the ailment. Oh. So we had to, this morning I mentioned the machine, mm -hmm. which, which is sort of like an automatic diary. So how would you feel if this gentleman said you have to do this diary for three months? And I said, you know. I can see what's yeah. going on. Because what we're really talking about here is also the changes in the way people think. Would you feel that you've been cheated because you're made to do the diary? Or would you feel that you were cheated because you were not allowed to do the diary? Mm -hmm. Because to me, the thing is, it's the human side that actually interests me enormously. Now, I can tell you the machine is better. I know this because it's a 24 measuring. And you can see I've just eaten, my glucose has gone up. I've just eaten something else that hasn't gone up. I've just exercised. Like it, it, it is actually better, and I'm not talking about what's better. I'm talking about what you would feel. Would you feel cheated which way? That you had to do something that could have been futile, or that you were cheated because you were actually not allowed to do something? I'm not sure how to respond. It, it seems like the issue that this particular example is really contingent on the disease, right? <laughs> that the the reason that. Jocelyn was asking them to keep the diary is because of the nature of managing diabetes. Yeah, but the advantage was better with this. But then you get immediate introverted feedback, mm -hmm. uh, which you can immediately apply, mm -hmm. rather than as it were presenting your homework yeah. to the doctor to get this stuff. So the question, the question is, is it homework, mm -hmm. or is it actually something more? That's what I'm trying yeah. to figure out, because it depends on how you look at diaries. But then this and is the I, issue of agency. But I, I know people who have one diabetes who come down both ends of that. 
that, that the dilemma that you're structuring. Some of whom really you know, like see the newer technology as, as, as important and better and are frustrated that they have had to be doing so much diarying on them earlier, right? And others who whom meet up with physicians that want to enroll them in these automatic systems and are immediately suspicious and think that this is not the right physician. And this is a difference just within people in the in, in early 21st century living with type 1 diabetes but with different relationships to that reporting impulse in the structure. Folks, I'm going to suggest that we continue this discussion over the break so we manage to stay on time. Thank you, Olivia, Thank you. again for a Thanks very, very, very inspiring session.